Um, I'm going to take a slightly different approach to um, that which Ian uh, took. Uh, I could have talked a lot about the breakthroughs in uh, rheumatology therapy over the last 15 to 20 years, and there really have been a lot, especially in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, and psoriatic arthritis. Uh, but instead, I'm going to talk about an area where uh, breakthroughs have been few and far between, uh, an area where really st uh, still a great deal of unmet need, and that's um, lupus. Uh, so my disclosures. I'll start with acknowledgement. So a lot of the work I'm going to be showing you from the lab is done by Sarah Jones, a postdoc uh, in, uh, in the lab. Uh, the lupus clinic at Monash is now headed by Alberta Hoy, uh, and under her are listed some of the uh, clinical PhD students and other clinicians uh, and registry managing team that we've now built up in the area and uh, support from uh, both academic and industry sources. So I'm going to talk about glucocorticoid use in lupus. Uh, and raise the concept with you that although we use these drugs every day, uh, we are doing harm uh, with them every day. And uh, there's a desperate need for us to find a different way to treat uh, autoimmune diseases in general and lupus in particular. And then um, in the second half I'll talk about some work we've been doing recently helping us uh, increase our understanding of the mechanism of action of these drugs, uh, which I think is necessary for us to move towards a better therapeutic approach. So just a primer uh, for uh, non-clinicians here or people who don't know much about lupus. Uh, it's often uh, written about as the archetypal multi-system uh, chronic autoimmune disease. So it arises in patients who have a break of uh, tolerance uh, to self-antigens, especially nuclear antigens. Uh, and unlike some organ-specific autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis or type 1 diabetes, uh, this is a multi-system autoimmune disease and a typical diagram from a textbook will show all the different body parts uh, and body systems that can be targeted in this disease. Uh, unfortunately, it most often targets uh, young adult females, uh, particularly in the reproductive years, and has a prevalence of about one in a thousand, um, and has an 85 to 90 percent 10 year survival. And I'll show you a little bit of data about that um, shortly. Uh, outcomes in lupus remain extremely poor. So this is a graph from uh, the Systemic Lupus International Collaborating Clinics which are the major centres of excellence uh, around the world uh, that have an inception cohort of over 1,700 patients, which is a massive undertaking. And this is the accrual of organ damage measured using the score, the SDI, Systemic Lupus Damage Index, uh, over years of follow-up. And what you can see is that there's an inexorable um, accrual of irreversible organ damage in patients with lupus, despite being cared for at the best centres in the world. We know that accrual of organ damage is associated with uh, risk of mortality. And mortality data in lupus have not changed in the last um, 10 to 15 years, unlike the mortality data in many of the very serious cancers. So this slide, which is 10 years old, uh, would still be uh, correct today. This is from the Euro Lupus cohort looking at 10 year survival, showing that patients with renal disease, and in our clinic that's 40% of patients, have a 10 year survival of 88%. Now, if you were a 70 year old, cancer patient and told you had a 12% uh, a 10 year mortality, that wouldn't be bad. If you're a 20 year old university student, a 12% 10 year mortality is pretty bad. That's a 12% chance of dying before reaching 30. So what is the patient experience in lupus? So this is a graph from one of our patients in our clinic um, monitored over uh, uh, five years. In the blue is shown the disease activity index, the SLEED eye. Uh, which is an integer score that we, um, that we measure in our patients. And as you can see in this patient, there is the typical uh, up and down or relapsing and remitting pattern of disease activity. Periods of relatively low disease activity interspersed with bursts of higher disease activity over uh, the many year journey of this particular individual patient. And shown in red is the accrual in this individual patient of damage using the same damage index that I mentioned before. And as you can see, uh, it goes up in integer steps and in this particular patient, the area under the curve of disease activity was associated with an uh, inexorable progression of irreversible organ damage. And we know that rising organ damage scores are associated with mortality. How do we have this data? Uh, it's because um, at Monash we started something uh, almost 10 years ago now uh, when we had a window of opportunity to apply for a new clinic funding and launched a lupus clinic. Uh, we already always had a lot of lupus patients at Monash. 
Uh, but those patients, like lupus patients in most centres, are medical tourists who go around from clinic to clinic seeing a different set of doctors for the different organs that they are particularly affected by. So we decided to try to change that and open a multidisciplinary lupus clinic where the two dominant um, uh, uh, clinical uh, streams of rheumatology and nephrology pooled our resources along with input from nursing and uh, strong research support from the university uh, to create Australia's first multidisciplinary clinic just for lupus patients. Um, all consenting patients now have had um, ongoing uh, longitudinal data collected since that time and is now Australia's largest cohort of lupus patients on which such data exists. Every patient at baseline has a demographics and various other data collected and a DNA sample and at every visit, and now we're over 5,000 visits, um, a disease activity score is recorded along with medication data, uh, uh, full laboratory tests and a serum sample. So we have uh, many thousands of serum samples matched to uh, individual uh, dis uh, visits as well. And every year we collect this damage score. So we can track individual patients over time, as I've shown you here, but we can also track cohorts of patients. And when we do that, unfortunately, the news is also not too good. So here is the damage score uh, that I've talked about already. And here is the adjusted mean SLEDI. This is the disease activity. And uh, the AMS is the area under the curve of disease activity divided by the time observed. So it's effectively the mean disease activity for that individual patient, and each dot is a patient. And as you can see, there are a lot of patients who've got high <coughs> average disease activity and a lot of patients who have got plenty of organ damage. We believe that we're offering our world's best uh, uh, standards of therapy to our patients, uh, but in our hands we are still having a lot of patients who are sick all the time and a lot of patients who are accruing damage, and we know these patients have a risk of death. Uh, so part of the reason that things look so bad uh, is because the treatment of SLE has not been one uh, littered with uh, miraculous new breakthrough discoveries. I uh, apologise for the slight formatting error here. So uh, steroids were introduced in the 1950s. Actually, the first patient in the world treated with glucocorticoids was a patient with rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, uh, rheumatoid, uh, rheumatologist at the Mayo Clinic was one of the three people who shared the uh, Nobel Prize in 1950 for that discovery. Lupus followed soon after. Antimalarials and nonsteroidals joined in the 60s to 70s, followed by cyclophosphamide and azathioprine. And for the uh, two decades when I was doing my training, there was basically absolutely no change in the treatment for lupus. Mycophenolate, a drug borrowed from transplantation, just like most of these others, uh, was introduced in the 2000s for the treatment of lupus nephritis, although without uh, a proper randomised trial and without um, uh, proper marketing recognition for this product. And not until uh, this uh, decade uh, was the first targeted monoclonal antibody for lupus introduced, belimumab, which is an effective therapy, but it's a very mild therapy and it's not effective in severe cases. And so uh, for all of this uh, period of uh, now six decades, uh, patients are still treated with glucocorticoids, or often referred to as steroids. So why have there been no breakthrough treatments for lupus? It's a very heterogeneous clinical disease, as I mentioned at the start. And almost certainly this is because of in intrinsic biological variation between patients. And the sort of unbiased big data approaches that are now um, uh, that have been applied in other diseases are now being brought to bear on lupus and it is emerging indeed that almost certainly lupus is not one disease and this kind of made up names that rheumatologists use for the diseases that they treat are going to be thrown away in a few years as we discover the actual molecular basis for these different conditions that happen to have some similarities in their clinical presentation. And so if you apply even a targeted monoclonal antibody therapy to a group of patients who are biologically distinct it shouldn't be surprising that you can't find a large difference to placebo, and many targeted therapies have failed uh, randomised trials in this disease. Uh, the biology is very complex, I'll show you a picture in a minute, and we have a problem that we have a huge range of possible therapeutic targets, and probably not enough patients to trial each and every one of them. So this disease is actually going to drive a different way of uh, testing novel therapies because we cannot rely on the conventional phase 2-3 uh, study paradigm to explore the potential benefit of these therapies in biologically unselected patients. And finally, because of the um, heterogeneity of the clinical disease, the ability to measure disease activity with a number and show a change in that number in response to therapy is actually incredibly difficult and uh, study design uh, has been hindered by these limitations. So uh, we are still treating patients with lupus mostly the same as we've been doing for the last 50 years, which is pretty embarrassing. So here's a picture from uh, Anne Davidson's review a couple of years ago in Nature Medicine on the pathogenesis of lupus. Um, I won't uh, uh, dwell on this except to show that there are many, many, many potential targets identified through study 
of mice, of human samples and the immune system in general. They include cytokines, cells that make those cytokines such as antigen presenting cells, T cells, B cells, etc., as well as intrinsic cells. And the whole thing is thought to be kicked off by some type of uh, upstream events resulting in the exposure of nuclear antigens to the immune system. But really there should be a lot more question marks shown uh, on this slide because there is a lot unknown. In the boxes are shown uh, some areas where uh, gene polymorphisms have been found to be associated with disease um, uh, development. So there's no shortage of targets, but there are problems in how to address them. And as a result, glucocorticoids remain the mainstay of treatment for lupus. This is data from Johns Hopkins, which is one of the largest cohorts in the world, showing that 50% uh, of patients have been exposed to prednisolone by the end of the first year of management. And after four years, 85% have been exposed to glucocorticoids. Only 15% of patients still not on steroids. And those data are very similar in our clinic, where 75 to 80% of our patients are taking chronic glucocorticoids. Now, we use our glucocorticoids because they work. They clearly suppress inflammation and reduce immunity. Actually, that's one of their major side effects is increased infections. And uh, we couldn't treat patients with lupus without steroids. We don't have anything that works fast to suppress inflammation. But it's becoming increasingly clear with a handful of studies in recent years and, and we, one that we've done, which we've just submitted, showing that actually the use of steroids is not all good. So this is from a large uh, Spanish cohort. And I'll just draw attention to this part of the slide, which shows uh, the same damage score that I showed you before, the slick damage index, showing uh, that there is a dose-dependent association of steroid use with the accrual of organ damage in lupus patients. And this is after adjustment for disease activity and all the other co-variables that you would imagine would contribute to disease-related um, damage. So steroids, although they suppress inflammation, are actually inducing accelerated organ damage in patients with lupus. And that is the case, obviously, in areas specifically glucocorticoid-related. Some of the points in this score come from things like osteoporotic fractures. You'd think of that as a side effect. But all of the ones over here are actually lupus-related things like end-stage renal failure, uh, etc. So there's something wrong with using steroids chronically to treat this disease. So now data from our own cohort from Diane Apostolopoulos, who's a PhD student uh, of ours who's studying specifically the harm associated with glucocorticoid use in lupus. And uh, when we look at measures that uh, are associated with damage accrual in our lupus patients, uh, this is the AMS, or disease activity score, that I showed you before. And an AMS above four, which is active disease, is associated with a doubling of uh, risk of damage. No surprise there, not quite statistically significant in this cohort. But uh, prednisolone dosing, this is adjusted by multivariate analysis for any association with uh, disease activity, is much more likely to be associated with organ damage than disease activity itself. And the cutoff for significance is 4.6 milligrams per day. And all the clinicians would know that's a very low dose of, of glucocorticoids. So we really think that we are doing a lot of harm to our patients uh, by treating them chronically with glucocorticoids. But we don't have any alternative yet. So glucocorticoid use is uh, uh, widespread in lupus. Uh, now it's becoming clear that uh, organ damage and adverse outcomes are strongly associated with glucocorticoid use, independent of the obvious association of prescribing these drugs with active disease. And therefore we must develop alternatives to glucocorticoids for the treatment of lupus. So, uh, 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 it's great to be here at a translational symposium and to be a Monash academic who is a physician treating patients and measuring them and also uh, uh, be lucky enough to run a research lab where we're studying some of the mechanisms associated with these events. So this is an ultra, ultra, ultra simplified version of the mechanisms of action of glucocorticoids. Please endocrinologists in the room forgive me uh, for this insultingly uh, inaccurate diagram. Uh, but basically the actions of glucocorticoids on the immune system are divided loosely into transrepression and transactivation. So in trans, I apologize for the formatting. In transrepression, the glucocorticoid, glucocorticoid receptor complex uh, binds in the cytoplasm to transcription factors such as NF-kappa B and prevents nuclear translocation of NF-kappa B. It can also bind to other uh, transcriptional regulators um, in the nucleus. But as well as that transrepressive effect, there's a transactivation effect where the uh, glucocorticoid receptor, when dimerized, is itself a bona fides transcription factor, binds directly to DNA, and induces the expression of other gene products, which include anti-inflammatory proteins, but also proteins with effects on uh, metabolism, 
which uh, induce many of the adverse effects on osteoblasts, gluconeogenesis, etc. And for a long, I'll just go back, for a long time it was thought that this dichotomy between trans repression and trans activation would provide the opportunity to, to develop drugs, synthetic glucocorticoid receptor ligands, that could induce only these anti-inflammatory effects without any of these metabolic effects. But about 12 years and a couple of billion dollars has been spent in the pharmaceutical industry attempting to do this, and so far it has not been successful. And the reason is probably that it's the wrong work to do. Uh, because uh, a few years ago it was shown that uh, using mice that had a mutation in the glucocortical receptor such that the GR was not able to dimerize, therefore not able to induce the expression of proteins, uh, that these mice did not have anti-inflammatory effects in complex models of disease. The paradigm that said that this should have uh, not worked was done in in vitro studies. When you do it in vivo, uh, here this is an antigen-induced arthritis model, this is wild-type glucocorticoid receptor and suppression of disease by dexamethasone, and this is mice who can't dimerize and the steroids don't work. So you must induce anti-inflammatory proteins to have the full therapeutic effects of glucocorticoids. So, We've been studying for the last several years uh, glucocorticoid-induced proteins with the goal of finding some that might um, uh, give us the opportunity to intervene uh, in our diseases in a more um, specific way. And I'll spend the last few minutes talking about this molecule uh, GILS, uh, GILZ, I think it's called in America, GILZ, we usually call it, glucocorticoid-induced leucine zipper. It was first reported in 1997. Uh, by a group studying uh, glucocorticoid-induced proteins in the immune system, much as we were doing at that time. And um, here's a, uh, a gel from that paper showing that in lymph node cells treated with dexamethasone, there's this profound induction of this previously undescribed protein, uh, which they named uh, GILS. And it was found to be associated uh, with effects on T cell survival. Uh, we took up um, study of this molecule uh, around about the mid-2000s. And uh, one of the first pieces of work that we did to determine whether it was interesting for rheumatology was to determine whether it was expressed in uh, rheumatoid disease and whether it, indeed it was sensitive to steroids. So this is a, an experiment from Elaine Baillieu, uh, published five years ago now, in human uh, rheumatoid arthritis synovial cells that we culture and treat with uh, increasing concentrations of dexamethasone. These are very low concentrations of dexamethasone, and this is uh, qPCR. And uh, in 25 years of studying glucocorticoid-induced proteins, we've never seen anything as sensitive to glucocorticoids as this. Uh, this is a 20-fold increase in transcripts at 1 nanomolar uh, dexamethasone, uh, and at 100 nanomolar, it's a 100-fold uh, increase in transcripts. And this is not only sensitive, but also fast. We see increased transcripts within one hour. Um, and this has been replicated now in cell type after cell type across the immune system. So clearly, glucocorticoid-induced leucine zipper is glucocorticoid-induced. Uh, to determine whether it was relevant to rheumatoid arthritis, uh, this was while we were still making a knockout mouse and didn't have it yet, uh, we decided to intervene using our in, in vivo siRNA delivery approach. And so uh, it's a little bit fuzzy, I'm afraid, but this is a synovial histology from a mouse with arthritis treated with control siRNA. This is the joint space here. This is inflammation. This is leukocytes in the joint space and in the synovial tissue here. When we silence gills using siRNA delivered in vivo, uh, this arthritis is much worse. Uh, here is destruction of the joint and a massive in increase in the synovial infiltrate uh, shown here in these um, uh, numericized histological scores and the clinical score was the same. So it's glucocorticoid induced and when you silence it, arthritis gets worse, suggesting it's an endogenous inhibitor of uh, inflammation, which is induced by glucocorticoids. So far, so good. I'm very glad this video works. Um, so uh, one of the next things we did was look at cultured human uh, uh, endothelial cells and using human whole blood in a flow chamber system, we can activate these endothelial cells with TNF and look at rolling, here's a rolling cell there, rolling and adhesion events, and we can induce rolling and adhesion by treating the endothelial cells with TNF. But if we overexpress gills in these cells, we see a greatly reduced number of rolling and adherent cells, and actually you can see lots of the cells just are shooting past there on that video, uh, their adherence is reduced. Um, we've done a bunch of other studies looking at various mechanisms of action, uh, but I included this one because it had a video. Um, uh, so, uh, then uh, we decided, okay, so blocking it makes it worse. Um, it, it, could we induce it and uh, result in a therapy? 
So here, um, with some uh, colleagues from the Netherlands, we developed an adeno-associated viral vector to deliver the murine-gill-z gene into the knee joints of mice with active arthritis. Uh, here are the controls, and here are the mice treated with uh, gills-inducing gene therapy effectively, uh, showing uh, that uh, after introduction of this, the progression of arthritic severity is uh, blocked, and this effect is roughly equivalent to the effect with a therapeutic dose of dexamethasone in these mice. So from a proof of concept point of view, it looks as though administering gills to inflammation is going to be beneficial. How does it work? Well, uh, it works actually by binding to NF-kappa B. And as I showed you before, that is how the glucocorticoid receptor works. It binds to NF-kappa B P65 and prevents its translocation to the nucleus. Here is a glucocorticoid induced protein that does exactly the same thing as the GR. So uh, others have shown this too, but we showed using CHIP, um, more recently using FLIM-FRET, which I'll show you here, uh, that NF-kappa B P65 has a physical interaction uh, with uh, gills when it's overexpressed. And the fun thing about using FLIM-FRET is that it's a time-dependent readout, so we can actually look at mutations of gills and also uh, post-transcriptional modification of gills to see if we can make super gills that is more um, effective, and we've got some clues about how to do that. So uh, we ended up in a situation in rheumatoid arthritis where we had lots of evidence of actions of gills relevant to the immune system. On synovia sites that I showed you, uh, other groups have looked at uh, macrophages, dendritic cells, T cells, etc. And it all looks now uh, actually as though gills is a very important anti-inflammatory uh, molecule. So if gills is a suppressor of autoimmunity and inflammation, and lupus is a disease of heightened autoimmunity and inflammation, could deficiency of gills predispose to or exacerbate lupus? Uh, so here's where having your lab in the same building as your clinic is, is a great um, advantage. So uh, Sarah Jones, who I mentioned, and Andrew Toe, who is a BMed Sci student, uh, collected blood from patients in the lupus clinic and uh, took it straight to the lab where we were able to do uh, flow cytometric subset analysis and uh, using permeabilization flow cytometry look at intracellular gills expression in these various cell subsets. And I won't go into the detail, um, but suffice to say we have been able to demonstrate that in uh, lupus patients uh, the expression of intracellular gills is lower in many leukocyte subsets compared to that in healthy controls. Now lupus patients are treated with drugs, uh, it's a complicated situation, so this certainly doesn't prove that low gills is the cause of lupus, uh, but it's in the direction that we hypothesise. What's more interesting is that um, uh, when we compare the disease activity in these patients, and this is the disease activity index that I measured bef mentioned before, each dot is a patient, and here is the gills expression of that patient adjusted for the prednisolone dose that they are taking. And we have to do that because prednisolone induces dex, uh, gills in these patients and we show that in these uh, samples. Uh, and strikingly, if you have a low amount of gills for the amount of, dex of prednisolone that you're taking, you've got high disease activity. And that was the case in all of these B cell subsets and also in many myeloid cell subsets, including plasmacytoid dendritic cells, which are incredibly important cells for producing type mm -hmm. 1 interferon in lupus. So the more gills you've got, the less lupus disease activity you've got. And we think that's a very um, exciting finding. So deficiency of gills appears to be associated with active lupus in humans. So could gills deficiency induce lupus? Uh, so we made a gill Z knockout mouse. Um, uh, that was quite hard to do because uh, it's on the X chromosome and uh, gills turns out to be the gene for male fertility. Uh, and the gills deficient mice are, uh, the males are infertile, so you cannot make a stable colony of gills deficient mice, but you can publish a paper that, gene, that gills is the gene for male fertility, uh, which, uh, which we did. Um, uh, uh, you know, serendipity is a fine thing. Uh, so, along, uh, so what we've done here is we've taken uh, cells from wild type and gills knockout mice and uh, exposed them to TH17 differentiating conditions. So IL-17 is a very important cytokine in autoimmune uh, inflammatory diseases, and it's made predominantly, although not exclusively, by a subset of T cells called TH17 cells. And here you can see that TH17 uh, cells are increasing gill Z knockout mice even without TH17 biasing stimulation. And under TH17 biasing stimulation, there's really a massive increase in the number of TH17 cells accompanied by a massive increase in IL-17 production. And in this paper, which came out a couple of months ago, uh, we showed a variety of mechanisms for this, uh, uh, in part driven by effects of gills on the effects of IL-6. 
So TH17, very important across autoimmune diseases, certainly including lupus. Um, but B cells are really super important cells in the autoimmune disease um, lupus. And uh, work that we've just submitted the revision of, uh, we've shown that in both mice and in humans, uh, uh, germinal centre B cells, uh, which are a very important uh, stage of differentiation of B cells towards uh, their uh, final destination of antibody producing plasma cells, have low um, GIL, so suppression of GILs is associated with B cell differentiation and activation. And in the absence of gills here in the mice, uh, B cell proliferation is gigantically increased. Uh, so this is a log scale. This is B cell receptor stimulation, which should induce energy in these cells, not stimulation. Uh, but proliferation is massive under those conditions and also under more orthodox um, stimulating conditions. So B cell differentiation is breaked by gills. When we looked at gills knockout compared to wild type mice in co collaboration with Brendan Russ from the University of Melbourne, there was a large range of genes expressed in the B cells of gills knockout mice um, that are overexpressed. And these genes are genes that have been associated in uh, GWAS studies with the development of lupus. And all the ones with an asterisk are statistically significant. So the knockout cells without any stimulation have got overexpression of a big range of very lupus suspicious looking uh, genes. And it turns out that if you let the mice age for long enough, uh, they actually develop lupus-like autoimmunity. Uh, so this is anti-nuclear antibody staining. This is the clinical test that's used to diagnose autoimmune diseases such as lupus. And this is anti-nuclear antibodies in unstimulated GILZ knockout mice compared to wild types. And here's the mean of a large number of mice. And uh, these mice actually have antibodies against double-stranded DNA and SM to completely lupus-specific um, autoantibodies that are used routinely in clinical testing and we actually modified a commercial clinical test in order to do these tests on the mice. Um, so they have autoantibodies, but they also have injury. Uh, this is uh, immunofluorescence of the glomerulus of gills knockout of wild-type mice and immune complex deposition of IgG and complement shown here in these glomeruli. So it looks as though gills deficiency does induce a lupus-like autoimmune state in mice, and it does that via hyperactivation of B cells and of the TH17 pathway, among a few other things. So we think that GILS is a key mediator or mimic of glucocorticoid actions uh, acting through NF-kappa B binding on things like TH17 and B cell expansion. And uh, the demonstration of autoimmunity in GILS that knockout mice, which we hope will uh, be re uh, reviewed, the revision will be reviewed positively uh, and come out um, in a couple of months' time, uh, we think is a major uh, breakthrough because we want to treat patients with drugs that have actions like glucocorticoids, but not metabolic actions like glucocorticoids. How are we going to test that? Um, I'm over time, actually. I should probably stop. Uh, well, suffice to say that we've made a, uh, a fusion protein uh, of gills uh, linked to this uh, uh, protein transduction domain, enabling us to deliver this protein into the cells. I'll skip over this slide, but we've shown that that protein um, does suppress TH17 activation and does suppress B cell expansion, the two phenotypes that we saw in the gills deficient mice. So from a proof of concept uh, point of view, we think we're onto something. And uh, finally, uh, there's strong evidence now that gills does not uh, induce the metabolic effects of glucocorticoids. It shouldn't induce those effects because those effects are largely due to binding of the GR to the GRE and inducing the expression of proteins. GILS doesn't bind to the GRE, there's really no way for it to induce those effects. And indeed in our hands so far, GILS and mice have a normal skeleton with no evidence of uh, altered osteoblast or osteoclast activity. Uh, in fact, if you overexpress GILS in osteoclast, you have an anti-osteoporotic effect. And so far we've seen no evidence of GILS uh, over uh, expression or therapy on gluconeogenesis, the other major thing that we would look for in this setting. So uh, we're pretty excited uh, that we may be on the threshold of uh, having a target that we can develop towards a therapy to replace glucocorticoids in the treatment of lupus. And with apologies for going over time, thank you for your attention.